Today, we are being joined by a very special guest, and I'm excited to get to her presentation. But before we do, I have a few quick announcements to make. First, I would like to point out a couple of bonus features which you have access to since we're running Zoom in webinar mode today. First, if you take a look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. If you click on that Q&A button, you'll get a window similar to the chat box, which lets you type in questions for the presenter. I highly recommend that you do just that. After the presentation, we have about 15 minutes set aside for questions, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in that time frame. Another button which you can see down at the bottom of your screen is the CC, or Show Captions button. When you click on the CC button, you can enable or disable Zoom's automatic closed captioning. It doesn't always do the best job with astronomical terms, but hey, maybe you can consider that some entertainment. You may have noticed from these slides that our webinar series has gotten a little bit of a rebranding lately. We've been making some changes in the new year, and one additional change is that we have some unique opportunities available for individual webinar sponsorships, which could be a great way to shine the spotlight on your astronomy-related business or project. If you're curious about our opportunities to sponsor a webinar, please send an email to avso at aavso.org, and we'll be happy to chat. Today's webinar has been very generously supported by Boyce Astro, and we would like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge them for their sponsorship. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. You can see their link on the screen right there. Right. Now, today we are fortunate to be joined by a very special guest whose research covers stellar astrophysics, including stellar structure, stellar evolution, and variable stars. You probably know her as one of the founders of the field of astroseismology, a crucial technique for accurately measuring the fundamental properties of stars. The rigorous mathematical models which she developed in the 1990s made it possible to begin applying astroseismology even before photometric data with the necessary precision was available. In the modern age of precision space-based photometry, her team has continued leading the way, leveraging statistical classification methods and machine learning to make new discoveries. Her list of accolades and achievements is so long that I would use up our entire hour if I tried to read them all. So I'll just go with a few of the highlights. In 2012, she was awarded the Franqui Prize. And in 2020, she earned the five-year FWO Excellence Award. Both of those are extremely prestigious honors, which have sometimes been compared to the Nobel Prize in terms of their stature. In 2022, she became a laureate of the Kavli Prize in astrophysics and just a few days ago, she was awarded the exceptionally prestigious Crawford Prize in astronomy. I've had the pleasure of watching a few of her lectures in the past, and what I saw was a truly unique combination of vast insight and an engaging passion for the sky. I, for one, am eagerly looking forward to the day when the Nobel is added to her list. With that, I would like to introduce our honored guest, Professor Connie Ertz. Welcome, Professor Ertz. Hello. Thank you so much, Lauren. <laughs> I guess I can just share my screen now, right? Absolutely. So let me try to get rid of this and put it on full screen mode. So you should see my slides now. OK. <laughs> So it's a really great pleasure, actually, to present this uh, seminar um, this evening for me. Huh? But for some, it's in the morning. For some, it's during the day. I actually have a, a special connection to the AAV VSO. So let me try to uh, uh, remind you of that. Uh, I wrote part of my PhD while living in Boston, and then I visited the AAVSO. That was 1993. So it feels a bit uh, good to be back, let's say. 
Okay, let us start with this um, webinar, and there are a lot of words in the title here. Huh? Astro seismology, I've included fast rotators because I want you to learn how it works for these difficult stars and opportunities. So by the end of the talk, I hope you will get a grasp of what all that means. And you can look up some other videos on my webpage, which I've indicated uh, on, the, on the slide here. But as an you know, take home message, huh? what are we actually gonna do? Well, we're, we're gonna enjoy the beauty of waves and waves, as I tend to say, allow to see the invisible. So for me, that's a great tool to have. And I always tend to compare it with waves created by earthquakes that uh, propagate through our planet and allow us, and are in fact the only way to allow us to probe really deep into our planet and study its physics and its chemistry. So we actually do just exactly the same, aside from the fact that the Earth is a sphere, more or less. Huh? It has a rocky material and water, while stars are gaseous spheres. But still, earthquakes sort of make the Earth deviate from a sphere. Starquakes, or stellar oscillations, sort of make the stars deviate from their spherical equilibrium, right? So in terms of mathematical descriptions, the two are quite the same. And it's fair to say that geophysicists have actually taught us a lot. So we are grateful to them. Now, you may wonder, you know, in, in the image, there is a, a, a detection of a seismic signal of our planet. Huh? And it's a pen that feels the consequences of the up and down motion. Of course, we can't fly to the stars and put our seismographs there. We do that in a bit more indirect way. But what is actually uh, amazing is that we can detect waves that are happening inside the stars by looking at the brightness variations caused because the surface of the star, of the gas, the hot gas, is moving up and down. And here you see the analogy in a graph. So in the top figure, you see a star observed by the NASA Kepler satellite that has quite strong stellar oscillations or star quakes as they uh, tend to be used. And by analyzing this blue detected light curve, as we call it, we can really dive deep into the star's uh, chemical composition, um, internal rotation, internal magnetism for some stars. And that's really amazing because actually you, you would not expect that we can peer inside the star. So what you see here is actually a 15 day more or less light curve with a brightness variation plotted as a function of time. Now this brightness variation is expressed here in parts per thousand. So one in a thousand. Huh? For those of you who are more familiar with magnitudes, huh, since you uh, uh, surely have some experience in observing stars, that is about the equivalent of a millimagnitude, if you like. Huh? So tiny for the human eye, but for uh, space missions with special equipments and modern uh, CCDs that are uh, also used a lot by amateur astronomers nowadays, this is quite well measurable. Huh? What's unique about this seismic signal is that it is uninterrupted during 15 days. Now, in reality, the Kepler mission didn't only observe it, this star for 15 days, but 1500, so 100 times longer uh, seismographic signal than you see here on the screen. I've blown it up for you to see how the oscillations interfere with each other. Huh? So you have strong interference, you have negative interference up and down. Huh? We call this uh, a beating pattern, if you like. Now, the art of astroseismology is to unravel the full signal that is in such a light curve and to couple it to the physics of the star. And so, that's what I hope you will uh, uh, learn after this webinar, huh? maybe with some uh, study material later on, but hoping you get uh, the basic uh, grasp of it, of what we do in our daily uh, research. Right? Now, where do we do this? I have brought this beautiful image made actually by the Gaia uh, satellite that is right now observing. Huh? 
uh, the stars in our galaxy. And you see also our close neighbors, uh, the small and the large Magellanic clouds. So this is basically the playground where we astroseismologists uh, can, can do our work. So this is not about extragalactic astrophysics. No, we're looking at tiny little variations, and that requires that the stars are not too far away in astronomical terms. And in practice, it means that most of what I'm going to be showing you, in fact, everything is going to be about stars that live in our own Milky Way. Okay. Another uh, representation of the playground, a very different one, a schematic one, is shown on this slide. So for the moment, we have detected oscillations, stellar oscillations, for a mass range of stars that ranges from 0.7 times the mass of the Sun, uh, symbolically represented by this brownish uh, star uh, on the left here, up to about 25 solar mass stars, which are actually blue uh, giant stars. Huh? And so uh, the image represents the sun in the middle. It's, it's not really to scale. And what's important here is um, we want to use seismic information for all sorts of topics in galactic astrophysics. Now, if you realize that a very big uh, massive star lives way, way shorter than a tiny little low mass star, huh, then you see that astroseismic data for the moment cover thousands and thousands of generations. Huh? where the stars on the left are just in their infancy in this universe, while those on the right have already passed like really thousands of generations. Uh, they live their life very fast, they explode as supernovae, they give their material to the interstellar medium, and new generations of these types of stars get born. So in terms of enriching the galaxy, the stars on the right, the massive stars, are much more powerful. Yeah, in, stores of, in, in terms of having the pristine material uh, from shortly after the Big Bang, the stars on the left are the more interesting ones. Uh, they are metal poor, but they have yet a very long time before they die and give their material back to the galaxy. Huh? So we're covering time scales in terms of uh, stellar evolution from millions to billions of years. And what's also important is that we're covering stars that hardly rotate very slowly. And when a star doesn't rotate all that much, it's very spherical to a high degree of precision. While we also cover stars nowadays, only since a few last years, and hence my title, that rotate very fast, close to their what we call critical rotation. Huh? What is a critical rotation? It means that the star rotates so fast that the centrifugal force is so fierce that it almost overcomes gravity. And so there would be no star if the star rotates at its critical rotation, which means that the gravitational force outwards compensates the gravity force inwards, right? That's what we call the critical rotation. And so nowadays, we can actually do astroseismic measurements also for very fast rotating stars. I'll come back to that uh, later, okay? Now, what are Starquakes or non radial oscillations is actually the more uh, valid scientific term. Here I'm showing you, without bothering you with uh, too many uh, mathematical formulae, animations. These are not real stars, these are animations of six stellar oscillations. Huh? And you see some blue and red areas that at the surface of the star are moving. And so you have to imagine that the blue points on these uh, graphs illustrate points on the stellar surface that are sort of um, um, coming towards you as an observer. So they move outwards, while at the same time, the red parts are moving away from you. So that's why you would see them redshifted if you could uh, have them in a spectrum. Now, you should realize that what we actually want to do is dive into the star. And that's why there is this <laughs> um, uh, you know, build, build out cuts uh, that uh, I made here schematically. And you see 
that the oscillations can have very different type of motions. Yeah? Now, in reality, we cannot resolve the surfaces of most stars. We can do that for a very few with, with interferometry, but in general, that's not possible. And also, even for those stars where we can do it, it's very difficult, almost impossible, to see the tiny up and down motions of all these oscillation modes going on, because it's just too small for an interferometric measurement. Right? So in general, what we want to be able to do as astroseismologists is we have a light curve. We don't have such animations in front of us. And we must try to couple the two of them together because each oscillation mode creates a wave, a, tra a wave that travels inside the star a wave that has a frequency, uh, waves have frequencies, as you know very well from sound waves, but also we need to have the geometry of the mode, which you see here represented in these animations. And we, astroseismologists, we love what we call in mathematics spherical harmonics. So what you see here are all spherical harmonic functions. And why is that? Well, your star is a, is a gaseous sphere in equilibrium that gets perturbed slightly perturbed by the star quakes. And so in the way this is described is best done in mathematical terms by such spherical harmonics, because they are an optimal type of, of mathematical functions to describe small deviations from a spherical body. So that's a natural uh, mathematical concept that we use, right? Now, these animations, are nice to have, but again, we can't observe that directly. Huh? We can also not observe directly the waves created by these up and down motions. So here, this is shown schematically by a slice through the star. Let's imagine we could um, make such slices. Huh? And in the upper right panel here, you, you see actually four waves drawn schematically, uh, one in red that doesn't probe the star very deeply, one in purple or a bluish, if you like, that goes straight through the middle of the star. These are my favorite uh, oscillations. And then a green and a yellow one that are almost at the same frequency and that uh, are drawn again in the lower image. Why do I show that? Because it, it illustrates what type of work we do and why we speak of astero seismology. So aster comes from the Greek uh, for star, seismos, it means oscillation, and logos is what we do a reasoning, we do a derivation uh, of uh, the observable created by the star quakes. And in that way, we can study actually the interior of the star. We do that by detecting the frequencies of the waves and by labeling what spherical harmonic is connected to each frequency. So that's what we need to do for each and every wave that we detect in the light curve because the brightness changes due to the up and down motion of the gas. Eh? If you increase the gas, make it bigger, then you get cooler and you have a lower uh, visibility, so to speak. Eh? If you decrease, then the star becomes hotter at the surface and you have a higher brightness, right? So a radial oscillation is the simplest star quake. In practice, we work with radial and non-radial oscillations, okay? Now, how do we deduce that from the data? A little bit of um, mathematics here. Let's imagine we observe a simple star quake, the brightness goes up and down periodically, as you see on this upper graph. This is a, a, a real big blue star, actually, that is one of my favorite ones. Huh? And you see the, the variability of the star, the brightness change as a function of time, huh? typically of the order of a few hours here. Now, if you Look at the, the, the lower graph. That's a Fourier transform of the light curve. We seismologists, we love to think in Fourier space. That's like engineers, huh? because they have to make sure to build uh, bridges that don't collapse. So they need to know the eigenfrequencies of the bridge. Well, I need to know the eigenfrequencies of the star. Huh? And so by transforming a sinusoidal variation, a periodic sign, into the Fourier space, you get one dominant peak that stands out here at about 5.2 um, 
cycles per day, you could call it, huh? because one periodic phenomenon translates into one frequency. Yeah. Now, one day is uh, 86,400 seconds. So, and, you know, for those who prefer to work in microhertz, I've translated that one per day is the same as 11.7 microhertz. Now, we don't have just one wave, one sinusoidal component due to one stellar oscillation. No, we have many at the same time. And then you get back to this observed light curve of that same star where I started off from. And now in the bottom panel, you see its Fourier transform, its amplitude spectrum, as we call it. So all these black lines that stand out above the noise level, and there are many tens, represent one oscillation. And the art is to get the frequency value. Well, Fourier transforms help us, but also to label for each of these black bars which spherical harmonic is causing it. And that's the hard part, right? Now, so how do we do this in practice? A little bit more. Well, we have very many different types of stars. I've already given you the mass range. Um, the age range is immense. And the rotation rate of the stars are also from zero rotation, no rotation, just a, a gaseous sphere that doesn't rotate around an axis, up to almost critical. Huh? And so there are very different forces at play inside a star, and these determine the character of the waves. You know this very well, I think. Uh, when you have a hot gaseous sphere and you perturb it, then you actually change the gas pressure. And that creates sound waves, also called acoustics wa acoustic waves. And so here you actually see these uh, measured for the sun. The sun is about the only star where we have a good resolving power at the surface. And there we actually see all this blue and red up, up and down motion of thousands of sunquakes, if you want to call them like that. But here we have a measurement where after integrating all the light into one measurement per time for its brightness. Huh? And then the Fourier transform of that. That's what you see here. That's sort of the symphony of the sun, if you like. And you see the strength of the oscillations plotted as a function of the frequency. And there's clearly one dominant frequency at about 3000 microhertz, right? Now, if, you, if you're more a person who likes to think in the time domain instead of in the Fourier domain, 3000 microhertz, if you invert that, one over 3000 microhertz, you get about five minutes, yeah? So the sun is... Uh, uh, Sunquakes move its surface up and down with periodicities around about a few minutes. Yeah? Now, the sun for me is just a simple, tiny star that has a slow rotation. It's almost spherical. Huh? But that's not the case for other stars. So in other stars, there are also other forces that may become dominant. And so I've listed uh, four more forces here. There's the buoyancy force connected to gravity that pulls the star together, and that creates gravity waves. Yeah? There's also rotation causing a Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force actually creates inertial waves, as we call them. If the star is magnetic, then there's also a Lorentz force. And that creates what we call alphane waves. And finally, if you have two stars that rotate around each other, you know very well it creates tides. Now, for me, tides are just forced oscillations. I can also define a tide like that. It's, it forces the two bodies who have a tidal pull upon each other to be um, changing. Huh? And so we call that tidal waves. So all of these can occur. And what is uh, easiest to study, because we know it best, is acoustic waves, because the sun has them, and because they have very short periods of a few minutes, and that we can observe during a night even. Huh? Because if you go up and down with a periodicity of five minutes, well, then you can observe many of these cycles, these signs going up and down, if you observe, like, uh, let's say, 10 hours uh, during a night, right? So uh, it's fair to say that astroseismology got kick-started thanks to the sun, helioseismology, and then we gradually moved to more difficult stars huh, thanks to space missions. Now, coming back to this, um, to this graph, so re recall the sun 
peaks with its oscillations at about 3000 microhertz. What is causing the solar quakes? Well, it's actually the outer convective turbulent motions in the, in the outer envelope of the star that make the gas move up and down. So if we now look at a similar star that also has this you know, convective outer motion, a successor of the sun, a giant, as you see indicated here. Well, what we would actually want to do is resolve the surface, but we can't. Uh, again, we see only one point per time frame, and we see that changing in time again, as in the right in, in the in the upper light curve. And we want to use that to dive deep into this star, right? We can help ourselves by Fourier transforming the light curve, as explained. But then we also have to label each of these frequencies with the kind of spherical harmonic. Now, we can do that very well for the sun. And of course, stars that are similar like the sun, we can then cross match that. We use the sun as a calibrator. Yeah? And so what we do in our daily uh, astro seismology life, so to speak, huh? uh, in, in our groups, uh, in our consortia with uh, a lot of PhD students and postdocs, we have our observations from space photometry nowadays. We also, if we can, uh, take ground-based spectroscopy or even interferometry if we can, if it's a not too faint star. We use the Gaia luminosities from the Gaia satellite. And then we get a star whose general property we have, it's total luminosity, it's because we know it's distant, huh? and its frequencies of its of oscillations. And we as, let's assume we can label each of the frequencies with a spherical harmonic. That's the observational side of our profession. Let's say. And then we move to theory and simulations, a bit more complicated on the, on, on the left here. What do we do? We actually mimic stars by computer models, computer stellar models that mimic the life of the star. And you need to tell the computer codes that we have to do that, the mass of the star, its current age, and its chemical composition. But inside these computer models, there's a whole lot of physics that we don't know very well. The internal rotation, the internal magnetism, the, interbul uh, the, the turbulent internal convective motions, and the way that the chemical elements, the isotopes, mix. So that's why I've indicated them in red. While we have a theory for that, it hasn't actually been calibrated from measurements that probe the deep interior. And so this is what astroseismology uh, brings and why it is so powerful. Huh? So we have these, what I call simple stellar models. We perturb them and we compute theoretically the oscillation mode frequencies per spherical harmonic. That's the eigenmodes and the eigenfrequencies of your computer model mimicking the star. And then we make a comparison between the two. We almost always see, even for the sun, that the match is not perfect. And it's also not up to the quality of the data. And then we can start to improve by iterating in this left column of this diagram. And that's a lot of work, which requires a lot of expertise from different people. Astrophysicists specialized in stellar rotation, in the magnetic fields of stars, in turbulence, even in the lab to mimic what is happening in stars, etc. And so this is a, a, a vibrant research field. Why? Because we have so many thousands and thousands of stars where we have the right column fixed nowadays, thanks to space missions. Now, we also did astroseismology already before we had space missions. And I like this particular example because that's, uh, that's a bit a little bit my star, so to speak. Huh? Uh, we can do astroseismology from the ground, but it's much, much harder. So here is a big blue star that we did. My supervisor, Christopher Walkins, already started it during his early career, and I continued. And as, we, as you can see in the years here in my references, we observed one particular star from the Southern Hemisphere in the Atacama Desert for 20 years. And that was necessary to unravel six frequencies that you see indicated on the left panel here, uh, where you see also this star has strong star quake, so to speak, uh, 15 millimac, uh, more or less. Yeah? And we could label these uh, frequencies 
thanks to our perseverance. And what you see on the left is actually uh, frequencies, six of them, but two are very close and three are very close. Why is that? Because this star is rotating quite slowly, but it's rotating. And as you will know from sound waves in a concert hall, if the musician would rotate on the podium, it would be horrible. Why? Because the acoustic waves that you hear as an audience would get shifted as the musician with the musical instrument yeah, moves with respect to you. That's also what you can hear with an ambulance, right? It sounds differently, the sirens, when it comes to you than when it moves away. Well, the waves inside the stars, even if you don't see them directly, we measure in the frequencies that the waves are experiencing rotation. And this was actually the first star, aside from the sun, where we could measure the rotation deep inside the star and also at the surface. We can do it at the surface by measuring like um, uh, spots or, or Doppler motion in a spectrum. So the envelope rotation is not so difficult to measure. The interior rotation you can only get from waves. And so for this star, we found that its core rotates four times faster than its surface. And this was a differential rotation measurement, the first one, aside from, from the sun. Okay. Nowadays, we work not with one star that you have to observe for 20 years. And why does, did it take 20 years? Because the daily rhythm is interrupted and intervenes, of course, when you have Earth uh, observations. Now we work with uh, beautiful space photometry from Kepler that you see indicated here on the left. It worked for four years, watched 200,000 stars, stared at it uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Then the gyroscopes broke down, but it still worked in the ecliptic, but only for a shorter amount of time. And now we have beautiful uh, tests, a very different mission because it does observations in sectors. It's, it's an all sky measurement, but only 27 days for most stars, except for somewhere it can observe for one year and then it turns to the Northern hemisphere, then back to the Southern hemisphere. So we have gap data. There are millions of light curves and please help us analyze them. Amateurs can do this uh, very well as well. It requires you to compute Fourier transforms. Why am I telling that? Well, we're in the big data era. And there are still a lot, of, uh, a lot of beautiful stars with stellar oscillations to discover in these millions of data. We use uh, machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence nowadays to have all these variability categories. I don't need you to understand this full slide, just so that you realize, oh, there are millions of light curves now, and I want to have the best stars to do my seismology. But I have to find ways to find the best stars. And this is not so trivial. Yeah? So uh, helping eyes are very welcome. Yeah? Now, this is a star pretty similar to the sun. Um, this star actually is supposed to be a copy of the sun. If you look at its spectral type yeah, in spectroscopy, where the measurement of the surface is brought into spectral information, this is an exact copy of the sun. But if you look at its star quakes, huh, where you see the uh, Fourier transform here, uh, the full uh, region in the upper panel, you see that this star has beautiful oscillations, just like the sun, very similar to what I showed before. But the maximum now peaks at about, well, uh, let's say 2,150 microhertz, more or less. Well, that's a lower frequency than the sun because the sun peaked at 3000 microhertz. These are sound waves huh? created by turbulent envelope in both this star and in the sun. It's a lower frequency. It means it's a longer period that the waves experience. If the waves take longer to travel through the star, it means it's a bigger star. So what does this measurement tell you a simple Fourier transform of the light curve immediately tells me how big this star is because I can compare it with the size of the sun. So that's fantastic. And you see the pattern again, and we can label the spherical harmonic functions because we know their values for the sun. Huh? And typically we see 
what we call low degree spherical harmonics. So the numbers indicated aside these red lines here are zero is for a radial oscillation, one is for a dipolar oscillation, so one nodal line at the surface, these were these white bands that I forgot to mention in the animations, two is a quadrupole mode, etc. Huh? We can even see three. So there is a clean pattern here that we also saw for the sun. And we seismologists, we measure the distance in frequency between, let's say, modes, dipole modes, or between radial modes, or between quadrupole modes. And we come to the conclusion, it's always the same distance in frequency. We call that the large frequency separation. These are sound waves. These are created by gas that changes in pressure. And so the ideal gas law is actually a good description of such a sphere. And if you still remember from physics, maybe in your high school, the ideal gas law connects the pressure with the density of the star. And the density, well, the density of a sphere is determined by its mass divided by its volume. But the volume of the star we know very well because we have just measured the size of the star from the dominant peak here. And we know that with a very high precision. So if you know the size and you know the density from this spacing, well, then you know the mass. And so by simply analyzing such a diagram, we can deduce with very high precision the size or the radius, if you like, and the mass of a star. And this is now common practice for many thousands of stars. And why is that important? Well, for people, for instance, who study exoplanets, uh, exoplanets is a very modern topic in astrophysics. And here is one of these people, uh, uh, Ashley Chontos, uh, whose picture I show here because this is a PhD student who made this graph for me. So then I always show uh, the the students. You see here. Um, Exoplanet host astro seismology in action. So all the, the points in this uh, big graph here are uh, planetary uh, radii. Huh? Now, if a, if a planet, how are they discovered? By planetary transits. Huh? So on the right, you see that uh, depicted. You have your star, your planet passes in front. It gives you a transit. And in order to deduce the radius of the planet, you need to know the radius of the star because that determines how big the dip is and the orbit then says how long it takes. Now, if we have astroseismology of the host star, then we can determine the exoplanet radius with a factor two improvement. And this is of course critical for the studies of exoplanets. Now, it's not only that, but you can also derive the age and that's, we do thanks to the wave. So only astroseismology can deliver the ages of planets. How do we do that? Well, the sound waves, huh, those that go into the deep interior of the star, like this purple wave that I showed in the uh, cartoon in the beginning, these waves feel whether or not there is a helium concentration inside the star. Huh? So the sun has momentarily created a helium ball inside its global sphere, thanks to nuclear fusion that translates hydrogen into helium. And the size of this helium ball is felt by the sound waves. Why? Because sound waves feel it when they surpass all of a sudden a different material. Huh? If I were to inhale helium, I would sound differently now than when I don't. Why? Because there would be helium in the area where the sound waves are created. And so aging exoplanets is fantastic thanks to astroseismology. Right. Now, here are red giants. And here you see stellar evolution in action. Huh? Because you see on the left about uh, how many? Seven stars, red giant stars, successors of the sun. Huh? And you see that the maximum uh, uh, frequency, the frequency of maximum power, if you like, increases from the bottom right to the upper left. Now, these stars, they, they differ in ages by tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of, of years. But we can see that they increase in size 
by comparing these seven stars with each other and put them in sort of an evolutionary movie. And then we scale the, the, the mass and the radius via the solar quakes, as I just explained. So in this way, we can age date all stars and size and weigh them um, by their acoustic oscillations, if they show them. And so we get nowadays precisions, as I've written down here, of two, four, and 20%. This is amazing. Huh? And then we can help and make the people happy who study the galaxy as archeologists. Why? Well, because the red giants are big. You can see them very well all across the galaxy. And so the coral mission, uh, that was a precursor uh, Kness mission, um, uh, on the European side and Kepler have actually probed red giants very far out in different regions of the galaxy. So if you have the mass, if you have the radius, if you have the age, what is still interesting for the astrometric studies, dynamical uh, studies of the galaxy, if you know where it is, so you want to know its distance. And so Gaia gives us astrometric distances, but we can also get seismic distances, provided that we have the radius and the temperature of the star. Now, the temperature of the star you can get from spectroscopy or from astroseismology. So when you combine that, you can compute the seismic luminosity of the star rather than using Gaia's version. And as it happens, you can turn a luminosity into a distance measurement huh? because a luminosity is intrinsic brightness. We measure the apparent brightness and comparing the two allows you to compute a distance. So astroseismologists nowadays also compute seismic distances. And it's amazing, but they are very compatible with the Gaia distances to within a few percent. So this helps greatly galactic studies, archeological studies of the galaxy, I would call it, okay? Now, let me move on to the fast rotators because I promised that and I'm uh, over a half an hour, I see. So I'm, uh, I'm gearing you up a little bit. Here is also a pattern. What I show here is again, a gallery of beautiful Kepler light curves. Huh? Each panel has uh, gray symbols. These are the data, the measurements of the variability uh, plotted as a function of time. And time is indicated on the upper axis. Like I'm plotting a bit more than 100 days. Um, in reality, we have 1500 days, as said. And overplotted in red is the Fourier transform. So that's the unraveling of all these beautiful um, beating oscillation uh, uh, signals that you see in the light curve in red in Fourier space. And you see again a pattern, but now it's very different. While in the previous graph, uh, let me go back to, you saw an increasing star. Now we're not measuring acoustic modes. We're measuring actually gravity modes. I know that because I am specialized in these stars. So here, the buoyancy force of Archimedes, as we called it in, um, in our uh, classes, huh? the buoyancy force is the dominant restoring force that decides the character of the waves. And you see, we are at very low frequency. Look, 20 to 30 microhertz. The sun is at 3000. Here we are a factor 100 lower frequency, or if you invert that, longer period. So 100 times longer periods. This is very difficult to measure from the ground. We just can't do that. And so this is a new, a new type of astroseismology that we could develop thanks to the NASA Kepler mission. And it all, it's only like five-ish years old. So we also don't have a sun to calibrate because the sun doesn't show these oscillation modes. So we don't have a calibrator and it's much harder to deal with. You need to take into account the rotational forces, so the Coriolis force, actually also the centrifugal force, but we are not yet capable of doing it, gravity, and then develop a whole scheme, a whole new modeling scheme that I showed you before. So there where we cannot rely on the sun, this is much harder, but the stars are much more interesting from my perspective, because these are hot massive stars and they are much more important in terms of 
chemical enrichment. So we actually want to know how they rotate in their interior, because if you rotate faster, and so the, the, the lower star here is a fast rotator, the upper star is a slow rotator. And to give you an idea, the upper star has a period of rotation about what, 180 days, let's say, the lower star only a few days. And if you rotate faster in your interior, because we're measuring actually the rotation in the deep interior of the star, by the frequency shifts. Well, if you rotate faster, then you mix your material way, way more efficient. And then you can live longer as a star. Why? Because the hydrogen fuel that sits outside the nuclear core of the star gets injected in the nuclear reactor, so to speak. And you have more fuel to burn. You have more hydrogen to transform into helium. So you can live longer as a star. So this is also critical to determine the ages of fast rotating stars. Right? Now I have assembled here the results that we got for these types of stars in this diagram, uh, where you see the core rotation frequency on the x-axis and the gravity of the star on the y-axis. So you could see the gravity sort of as, uh, evolution going from left to right. So all these stars that have like a gravity between 4.5 and 3.5, these are typically stars that are burning hydrogen into helium, main sequence stars, as we call them, eh? or dwarfs, if you like. And the gray uh, stars are gravito inertial mode pulsators of spectral type F. So these cover masses from about 1.3 to 2 solar masses. The purple ones are more massive stars. So these are actually uh, having masses from 3 to about 10 solar masses. Right? And you see there is a complete variety of internal rotation frequencies. So zero, very slow rotators, 30 microhertz. That is almost critical rotation for these stars. So they are really swinging around very, very fast. And then as stars grow older, they become bigger huh? because they turn to the to the red giant phase. Now, if you expand your star, then you slow down. That's conservation of angular momentum. So once stars are uh, having a gravity in log space here uh, to the left of three point, no, sorry, to the right, uh, to the smaller values, these stars are really slowed down, but they are differently slowed down than theory predicted before we had gravito inertial mode astroseismology. So this chart is actually one that we still use daily because our theory still cannot explain this for the moment. Huh? I've indicated one blue star there because it's again, one of my favorite ones. Why? Because we are now, thanks to Tess, adding more and more stars, star by star is really uh, challenging. And that is a, a, a latest measurement of a star that will later explode as a supernova. And so um, one of our quests, particularly in the Leuven team, is to upgrade this diagram, keep adding stars. And like 10 years ago, this diagram was empty. There were no stars. And that's, of course, what astroseismology brings to stellar evolution and to studies of the galaxies. And I guess that's one of the reasons why we get prices, because there is no other way than astroseismology to get to this information, right? Now, we can even do some something more for like 1,800 stars in the previous graph compared to zero about 10 years ago. And 110 of them do not even have a measurement of the inner core rotation, but also of the outer envelope rotation from Pressure modes. Huh? So the gravity modes allow you to, to probe the really deep internal rotation. The pressure modes, the acoustic modes, huh? they allow you to probe the envelope just like for the sun. Huh? And then you see these two connected. That's the level of differentiality that you have inside your star. And the bigger this level of differentiality, so the longer these dashed lines, the more material you mix. And what came as a total surprise to us that no theory predicted was that these gray stars, these young stars that are currently still burning hydrogen in their core, they're almost rigidly rotating. While if their core shrinks and their outer layers expand, they should be differentially rotating. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we need to make fixes in standard theory of stellar structure and evolution. We really need to have a better theory because there is a stronger 
coupling of angular momentum of the inner core to the outer layers. And this was not covered by standards theory. So we are working on that on a daily basis, let's say. So if I come back to my scheme of my modeling scheme that we use, then it's fair to say that we still face discrepancies up to a factor 100 even for massive stars on the level of internal rotation. So the theories are being developed, improved, as I speak, huh? some only work with the uh, uh, rotation theory, taking into account the Coriolis force. Others also include, include internal magnetic fields because we also have the first measurements of direct internal magnetic field measurements since last year, actually, in red giants. And we are now discovering them also in dwarf stars that are uh, still young in their evolution. So uh, in brief, the magnetic field also gives a frequency shift, but it's in a different nature than the rotational shifts. And so we start to learn to unravel. Now, let me move on to my final few minutes to, I haven't discussed tidal forces, huh? tides in closed binaries. So here's a graph of the level of multiplicity as a function of stellar mass. And the stellar mass is logarithmic here. It's just a schematic uh, drawing. And you see this red line indicating that if you're above 10 solar masses at birth, you're almost sure to have a companion. That's basically what this graph says. And so the two uh, cartoons illustrate that massive stars have a companion, a close companion. And if you have a close companion, then you have tidal forces, whether you like it or not. And tidal forces create oscillations that are tidally driven. And you see that here on the right in a cartoon. Huh? It's an... You could call it artist impression, but on the left, you see three stars that actually reveal beautiful forced oscillations. Huh? So what you see here is an orbital phase as the stars revolve around each other. They sort of eclipse each other huh? or they are deformed. And you see that uh, uh, highlighted in the orbital phase diagram of the light curve that has been observed by the Kepler mission. And on top of the red, the red curve you would have if the stars would not have oscillations. It would be a smooth, geometrical, deformed light curve. But on top of that, while they rotate around each other, the stars, one of them or two, have oscillations. And these oscillations can be of a very different nature. They can be due to the tides because tidal forces are extra forces that you don't have in a single star. Or it can be that your star has its natural eigenfrequencies that it would have as a single star. But since there is somebody pulling these natural free oscillations, as we call them, are tightly perturbed, as I've indicated. And for some exotic cases, you even have stars, like in the next graph in the cartoon, whose axis of the oscillation is tidally tilted because the companion is pulling so dramatically. And so this is a beautiful paper, uh, example from a paper by Zhao Guo, who's actually sort of leading this um, research uh, topic, I would say, um, from his early uh, PhD onwards. So uh, you see really a number of ups and downs superposed per orbit. You see that? 26 times you go up and down. Huh? Because tidally forced oscillations in an eccentric orbit are dynamical tides, right? And they occur at exact multiples of the orbital frequency. Now, where do you get a resonance between oscillations and tides? Well, in the periodicities of days. And that's exactly where G modes are, as you have hopefully understood from my gravito inertial modes. So we are currently trying to upgrade astroseismology to tidal astroseismology. It's very difficult, it's not easy. And then in order to round off really, one thing that we must also admit is that stars are deformed by the centrifugal force. They are flattened and there is no astroseismology that can handle this. I am in the lucky circumstance together with three other PIs to have received a very big grant, a European grant, uh, from the European Research Council to develop astroseismology of flattened stars. We are only starting our project, and what we have to do is get rid of our spherical symmetry assumption. But all the computer models of stars assume spherical symmetry. So it sounds easy to move from a sphere to a spheroid that is flattened, but I can tell you that both mathematically and physically, 
it is really, really hard. And so we're going to try to design new computer models in higher spatial dimensions. And with that, uh, I'm also showing you a picture. I'm very proud of this picture of the PLATO mission, which is actually a mission of the European Space Agency to hunt for planets around stars. Why do we need another one? We want to dedicatedly build this mission to hunt for copies of the Earth around copies of the Sun. So long-term orbits. There where TESS is specialized in short-term orbits. And Kepler was specialized in quite long orbits, but the stars were very far away. Plato is 26 telescopes on one platform. And you see here it's real. Eh? You see me in the clean room at uh, ESA in Northwijk in the Netherlands, where the mission is being literally built and calibrated. And that will give us an analogy, uh, so to speak, to big grants that are given for better theory and computer models, better data of closer stars uh, dear to us to improve astroseismology for the whole mass range that we are covering. So let me end by putting up my fountain of opportunities, as I call it, for astroseismology. Whether you work in exoplanets or in gravitational waves that are close binaries, whether you do galactic archaeology, whether you do star clusters, astroseismology is here to help these studies. And with that, I'm going to close this seminar. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Ertz. Wow. All right. So we do have um, several questions which have come in already. Um, I think I will begin by reading out uh, this question from Timothy Weaver, who's curious about the effects of low atmospheric density on uh, seismology, specifically like with red giants, you know, uh -huh. in general, how does how does density affect these waves? Yeah, so for a giant, you're right, they are very expanded. So it's uh, far less uh, dense material in the envelope than in the deep interior. And so this uh, is captured by the sound waves, actually, by the, by the pressure mode, as we mm -hmm. call them. And so by analyzing the frequencies of models that have a bit less dense and st stricter dense envelopes, different computer models, we, we see in the theoretical predictions which is right. So this is how we tune the very outer layers of fluffy stars, as, as you could, inflated stars, you could call them. Uh, so that's quite well captured, provided that we can detect the oscillations. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. All of what I said today can only be applied if we can measure the waves, frequencies, and if we can label them with the appropriate spherical harmonic, OK? Thank you. Um, Related to that, we did have a question come in from a user on Facebook who's curious about, you know, detecting these waves since the variations are just so minute. Um, mm -hmm. If basically all stellar bodies have such oscillations, then how do we photometrically get these data points? You know, traditionally we use comparison stars, but what if the comparison star also has oscillations? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. So that is thanks to detectors uh, on board Kepler and TESS and Coro and in, in the future Plato. So um, these detectors actually do a relative measurement. It's true that we don't have an absolute flux calibration, but we don't need it because we just see the variations and these go as parts per million. Huh? The, the CCD detectors that, that are on board of these missions really can measure at a level of one in a million. This is fantastic. And that's the reason why uh, we can't do astroseismology from the ground when the when the you know excursion of the visibility uh, uh, of the star changes by less than a millimag, because the millimagnitude is sort of the, the limit that we can reach on ground, not because the detectors are not good, but because we have an Earth atmosphere <laughs> surrounding us. And even in Chile, in the Atacama or in the Antarctic, where the, where the conditions are optimal, we still have an Earth atmosphere and the light has to pass through it. Mm -hmm. So there is millimag level precision we can go a bit lower nowadays also from the ground but 
uh, when we operate outside space, uh, outside the Earth atmosphere from space missions, it doesn't bother us. And above all, it doesn't give interruptions in the data because there is no a satellite doesn't care about our day and night rhythm uh, where uh, observers have to care about. So, so it's really a relative measurement, a change in the relative brightness. That's what we are aiming for. And we're not using comparison stars for that because you're right. If we were to have to do that, then you have a much more difficult case because <laughs> all stars are, turn out to be variable. Whether you like it, or, I always say, whether you like it or not, the stars have oscillations. Now, not all of them have uh, periodic oscillations that are always ongoing. So that's what I've been using here. I, I need a periodic phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some some stars, some objects, all objects vibrate. Let's, let me put it like that. But... Uh, Several stars ha also have vibrations, but they're damped. They, they, they don't sustain. And that we can filter away because the Fourier transform will tell us what is damped out and what is periodic. Huh? Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. And um, while we're on the topic of astroseismic observations, John Fisher was curious about, um, you know, when satellites are making these observations, do they generally use filters? And would there be any benefit to using perhaps like a narrow band filter focused on a single spectral line, would that help increase contrast? Yes, it, that's a very, very good question. So for now, the Coro mission, the um, Kepler mission, the TESS mission, they all have a broadband white light filter, a bit like our eye, so to speak, a bit broader to the, a uh, bit redder, let's say. Um, that's because they're actually built to detect uh, exoplanets via uh, transits. And, and you need to be in the optical near infrared to, to do that optimally. Yeah? So actually, the Starkway data are just a spin-off, but a very successful spin-off. Huh? <laughs> I always say that they can have their planet detections as long as I have my Starkways. Yeah? Now, PLATO will be the first mission with high precision, high cadence uh, uh, photometry capability in two photometric bands. And the reason is clear that we we will have more information in that sense. And it will help in particular to identify the modes, the labeling of these spherical harmonics. That's a technical detail I will not go into. But if you have two different filters, then this becomes easier because of limb darkening. You know, all these stars also have darkened limbs. And the interaction of the spherical harmonic nodal lines with the limb darkening tells us where the nodal lines are. So, I mean, uh, you, you have to take my word for it that we can compute mathematical formula that help us. So on the one hand, we gain information. On the other hand, if you have a more narrow filter, then you lose photons. Mm -hmm. huh? And so the signal to noise level is much harder to get. Huh? reaching parts per million, if you have a narrow filter or a very broad one, yeah, that makes a difference. So it's a trade-off. Uh, we're not doing very narrow filters in Plato. We're actually doing a broad filter that we cut in two for two of the telescopes. And all other 24 telescopes have the broad filter. So that's the best combination of having the good signal to noise from the 24 telescopes, but colored information from the two uh, Telescopes that also uh, serve for the attitude control of the satellite. But so Tess and Kepler didn't have that. They had just one single band uh, photometry. Ground-based photometry, of course, is done in multicolors. And so in, in principle, that's more powerful. But again, you only can reach millimagnitude precision rather than micromagnitude. Huh? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. And um, just as a quick follow-on question to that, um, we did have a uh, attendee ask if possibly a narrowband filter like out in the near infrared um, would help with improving contest, contrast for the specific case of observing from the ground, um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so in general, on ground, it's much easier for us to have all sorts of filters, uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, placed in front of the detector. And then you can... You can um, you can tune towards more infrared signature versus more blue signature. Now, in general, a star is very much like a black body into a zeroed order, very rough approximation. We call it a black body radiator. And so depending on the, on the star's temperature at the surface, it has a strong flux either in the blue, if it's very hot, 
or in more to the red eh, uh, if it is very cool. So depending on whether you, you want to do astroseismology of very cool stars or very hot stars, well, your filter is better chosen optimally according to the, the, the Planck radiation of your star, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so, so we can experiment with that in ground-based astroseismology, but this is hard to, I mean, you can't uh, build an infinite number of space missions, each with their own different filter. That's horribly expensive. So, so that's why we're starting with two for Plato, which is, I think, a good start. Sounds like it. Okay, thank you. Moving on now from the topic of filters uh, towards the topic of modeling. So Andre Kovacs asked if um, it would be possible or useful to employ MESA models in the study of- Oh, oh yes, of course. We, we, I'm, I'm doing daily MESA modeling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. So cool. uh, let me go back to this uh, here, huh? uh, to this scheme, right? So mm -hmm. everything on the right, when I said numerical stellar models, that can be done with with computer codes like MESA. Eh? So MESA is a stellar evolution code that produces numerical stellar models in equilibrium. Yeah. Now, some people use MESA, other people use other codes, like uh, you have a Geneva code, you have a Grenoble code, you have, you have lots of codes, you have Italian code, whatever. Eh? There's a whole bunch of them. The nice thing about MESA is that it's publicly available for everybody and it is quite user-friendly uh, to use. So that uh, is very important for the upper box here on the on the left, numerical stellar models. Then we have these models in equilibrium, and then we must, must uh, couple the output of MESA or of any other stellar evolution model. This equilibrium model, we must perturb it. And so for that, we have built pulsation codes. And so these pulsation codes, there are also a few. Huh? Um, there is a, a gyro pulsation code that is automatically coupled to, to MESA in the sense that output of MESA is input for gyro, which was written by uh, Rich Townsend, a beautiful software developer and expert in theory of pulsations, who is actually visiting us on sabbatical now in Leuven here. So, so there is a, a set of pulsation codes that you can use to make the theoretical predictions in, in red indicated here in the lower left. So, so there is a whole lot of activity on this um, left panel of the side. It, it, it looks simple, but there are many people working in this area and improving the improvements that I was talking about that we need to include include better forces like the Coriolis force and the Lorentz force. We need them both at the level of the upper box, the MESA models, the numerical stellar models, but also in the stellar pulsation box. Because if there is an additional force or the tidal force, for instance, yeah, our, our um, numerical pulsation codes also need to be upgraded. And so this is heavy computing, heavy testing, validation, go back to the right panel, where the observations guide us and running around the circle through this whole mm -hmm. modeling scheme. So that's actually our, our daily uh, work, so to speak, where we have people specialized in the, in the right-hand side, in the left-hand side, and in each of the boxes even of, of the left and the right-hand side. So you, you really need to, to intertwine, and that's why it's so, so nice for me, like uh, computer engineering, um, Time series analysis is uh, mathematicians. We need better physics. We need good uh, chemical isotope uh, computations. So it's it's one mixed bag of what we call integrated STEM. For me, astroseismology is a prototypical example of a uh, integrated STEM project because we need the space missions and there's the technology as the uh, as, as the fifth component actually, right? Mm -hmm. So very good question. It's very interesting to hear about. Thank you. Okay, um, and then here, here we have a quick question from Ray Tomlin, who is curious about um, what's the speed that we're talking about with these uh, pressure waves? How fast are they moving around the star? Oh, so, well, you have, sp you have oscillation velocity, uh, up and down motion in velocity space due to the uh, oscillations, but you also have the rotation. Uh, and even for a star like the sun, the sun is a very slow rotator, but not that slow. I mean, it's 26 days on average 
uh, in its equatorial plane, right? So you have motions up and down five minutes, which are tiny. Yeah? I mean, uh, 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 a very tiny 0.001% in radius, you go up and down in five minutes, right? But of course you have uh, an azimuthal velocity due to, due to the rotation. And so these two velocity fields are intermingled. And for a star like the sun, you can unravel them because the periodicities are so different. Huh? Like, I mean, when the star does one revolution in 26 days, but it goes up and down in five minutes, well, then you can sort of pretend that during these five minutes, it hasn't rotated, right? That's the ratio that's important. So it's more, rather than speaking in terms of velocity ratios, what's much more important is the ratio of the periodicities of the oscillations versus the rotation. And that's what determines whether or not you have to include the Coriolis force uh, or not. Yeah. If you can afford not to do it, your mathematics is way easier. If you cannot afford it, like in the gravito inertial astrosismology, it's dominant. I mean, the oscillations are slower than the rotation. Well, then you can't ignore the rotation, right? That's uh, why it's so hard and why we only dived into it. And few groups do because it's really much harder. But now the data are there and motivates us to invest uh, in long-term developments of better methodology. Before we had the space data, people were not really, um, how should I say, motivated to spend years of their career to develop a new framework that, that works, including the Coriolis force, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, speaking of the Coriolis force, we had a question specifically about that from Bishal Kumar, who was wondering if you could elaborate on um, how you distinguish between signals due to that force and due to mm -hmm. other forces, such as tidal forces that are present. Ah, yes. So here's here's my uh, one of my favorite uh, galleries again. So so the Fourier transform and the position of the peaks of the frequency. Yeah, you see the shift, yeah? and this shift is really due to the Coriolis force, right? So that's the way we deduce. Oh, is this a rapid rotator or not? Huh? Uh, once we trained ourselves in recognizing it, we can use this plot, so to speak, as a as a gallery. And then if we have a new star, we can compare it. Yeah? That's one, that's one uh, part of the answer. So I know that these stars have frequencies that are in the inertial gravito inertial regime, uh, we say. That means that the periodicity of the waves is uh, of the same order of magnitude than the periodicity of the rotation. Now, the interesting question is about the tidal uh, force. So let me go to this beautiful graph that was made by uh, Zhao Guo of, oh, this is one click too far. Here, what you see here, I know for sure, and Zhao paved the way, are tidal oscillations. Why? Because they exactly occur at exact multiples, and you see the zeros typed here, 26.00 times the orbital frequency, 29.00 times the orbital frequency. Yeah. So we deduce the orbital frequency either from an eclipsing binary where we can see it in the photometry, huh? that's the same as a planetary transit, or from spectroscopy where we have a radio velocity measurement while the stars revolve around each other. So determining orbital frequencies is fairly easy for us. It just takes patience huh? because orbits are typically of the order of days to months to even years and, and even longer. But as soon as you have the orbital period, then you can go and see in the Fourier transform where is a peak at a frequency that is an exact multiple. And if that occurs, then I know it's caused by the tidal force, right? Mm -hmm. If it is not at an exact multiple, then it will be an oscillation that could also be there if there would not be a tidal force. So if the stars uh, were single. And in practice, you see the two combined, huh? because this depends on the strength of, again, either the pressure, the gas pressure force or the buoyancy force, in a single star versus the tidal force that's being added because there's a pull by a companion. And of course, if the two stars have oscillations, then we would 
then, which is not the case here. Uh, in that sense, my cartoon is a bit misleading. Huh? Um, then we would also have multiples uh, of the orbit in the two stars, but their frequencies that would be there anyway, if they would be single, would be in a different regime. Huh? So we can still unravel that, but it's not easy. Huh? And so this is a field in astroseismology that I'm completely fascinated about and that I want to move into, but it's not easy. And I think it's fair to say that both on the theory side and on the observational side, we need more work and more brilliant minds to progress the field. But if I then go back to my very last slide, this is extremely important for people who do gravitational wave studies, another modern field of uh, astrophysics, and who do close binary evolution. Because there, of course, you cannot avoid the fact that there are strong tides. Huh? And so we are really upgrading. Actually, we just got a, another big grant. Uh, in addition to the one from the European <laughs> Research Council, we got a local one from, uh, from KU Leuven here at the university to do exactly that, to develop tidal astroseismology for close binaries. That's excellent. I'm excited to hear that. Thank you. So um, speaking of tidal oscillations, you know, those obviously are excited by uh, the binary companion. But what about in the case of single stars? We have this uh, question from John Fisher asking, what initial impulse creates oscillations? Where does the stress come from in the case mm -hmm. of single stars? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a very good question. Of course, there are at least three ways that we know of that create the oscillations, right? The first thing is by planets, because they also create tides, right? And if there's a big Jupiter quite close to a small star, then it can create tidal oscillations. This is not the dominant reason, but there are e examples, right? Mm -hmm. um, th the most important reason, like for, for stars like the sun, and the successors for red giants or even red supergiants, you know, these stars have an envelope, an outer envelope that's quite cold, right? And it has a lot of turbulence. The reason for this convective motion, as we call it, is because the energy created in the inner part of the star by the nuclear fusion creates photons, and these photons diffuse towards the outer layers of the stars, but all of a sudden they hit cool material and they can't pass there anymore. So the energy can't be transported very effectively anymore, and then the gas starts boiling, as I call it. Uh, it's it's bubbling gas. It's a bit like a, a water stove in the kitchen. You know, you add, you keep on adding heat, <laughs> and at a certain point, it starts boiling, right? Because the the heat can't go away anymore efficiently, and you get you create bubbles. And as soon as you have bubbling gas or bubbling water, your your star starts to oscillate, and that creates the sound waves, right? So this is true for all stars with an outer convective envelope or with outer turbulence, let's say. Right? Now, these massive stars, these hot, massive blue stars, they have a different reason to oscillate. There, as it happens, um, in their um, layer, they, they don't have any turbulent outer convective layers. No, they, they, there the photons can pass through the envelope quite neatly, cleanly, so to speak, except for a few layers. And these layers are layers where typically the temperature is such that you have isotopes that are as what we call partially ionized. Huh? Let's take the example of, of, of uh, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is the simplest uh, material. You have a nucleus and you have an electron, right? And the electron rotates around the nucleus. Now, such an atom can only exist if the temperature stays below typically about 10,000 Kelvin. If it becomes hotter, then what happens? The electron moves away. It, it, it flies away. We say that the matter gets ionized. Now imagine in these hot blue stars, there is somewhere a layer of 10,000 degrees. What happens in that layer, it's a tiny transition layer where the temperature is about right to have both hydrogen that still has its electron circling its nucleus and that has free floating electrons that have escaped already and pure uh, protons. It's much harder for photons to pass through such a partially ionized layer. And there the radiation energy, that is photons, is captured and turned into mechanical energy. It's a bit like a, 
a car. A car works uh, thanks to a, a Carnot thermodynamical cycle. We, ca we call it the Carnot cycle, if you like. And so hot stars have these few layers that can translate the radiative energy into mechanical energy and make the star oscillate. Huh? We can compute that um, analytically almost by beautiful mathematics and integral equations, but you, you have to take my word from it, that there is a what we call a heat engine active in these stars. So these are three basic ways that can create star quakes. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, I think we have enough time to take three more questions. Um, the first of those comes from Matthias Kolb, who asks if accretion and decretion disks in extremely fast rotating uh, stars, such as BE stars, can influence their astroseismic modes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, excellent question. A whole talk by itself. <laughs> so what uh, this question is, a BE star is very rapidly rotating and is flattened, and they tend to have a disk, huh? a disk around them where material flies away, so to speak. Why? Because the, uh, the centrifugal force uh, almost reaches the critical rate, where I started off from in the beginning, and you only need a tiny little bit to fly away. Yeah? And uh, oscillations are actually proposed as one of the mechanisms to, to give that tiny little bit of speed that you would need. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a centrifugal force active and if you have an outflow, an outflow is again an additional force. It's, it's, um, uh, it's an additional force that we now do not yet have in our oscillation equations. because Not because we don't find it important, but because it is so difficult. Why is it so difficult? If you have an outflow, then you don't have a static atmosphere of your star. So you need a dynamical atmosphere because there's constant motion, flyaway motion. And that has to be included in the oscillation equations. And then we have to even try to solve them. <laughs> and that sounds easy, but it's not. So we have what we call energy wave energy leakage in these stars for accretion it's a bit the opposite i could say, say, tell the same story and that's why pre-main sequence astroseismology is also still in its infancy these are stars yet about to be formed and they accrete material so then you don't have a decretion disk but an accreting disk and above all the star is spinning up when it accretes matter so there again you have infall and that's again a force that we should take into account, and we have a hard time to do that. Why? Because we don't have a good theory of accretion. So, yeah, much more work. It would need additional grants to these two uh, <laughs> phenomena to take them into account, but very interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Okay, um, this next question here comes from Chuck Cinnamon, who is curious about if there could be um, an application of astroseismology alongside the other uh, multi-messenger astronomy fields mm -hmm. in terms of monitoring um, potential supernova progenitors in the Milky Way. Um, he cites an ongoing project which has a, a list that they've recently created of uh, Milky Way supernova candidates should those be studied in depth for astroseismic characteristics? Yes, of course. That's why, you know, in one of the plumes in my fountain here has gravitational waves and binary evolution exactly for that reason. Huh? So for the moment, it's fair to say that the astroseismology is dominantly being developed for the biggest uh, chunk in a star's life. And that is 90% of the star's life uh, it, it is uh, burning hydrogen into helium. But during 90%, it rotates and it mixes. So that has the biggest impact. And that's why we're focusing there. Not only that for a reason, but it's easiest to observe stars in that evolutionary phase. Eh? It, it, it lasts millions to billions of years. While in the very end phases, like carbon burning, uh, just before supernova uh, explosions happen, it takes about a thousand years and silicon burning two days. Well, we can't catch stars in that phase and study their quakes. That's a pity. 
And so we have to backtrack a bit to earlier uh, evolutionary phases. So what we are trying to develop now is astroseismology for stars in the core helium burning phase. That's, mm -hmm. that's still long enough to find them, but it's very difficult. That's at the stage with, uh, uh, where, where massive stars are blue supergiants. Huh? Now, if you do that in binaries, then of course you have the optimal progenitors of gravitational wave sources. So it's fair to state that we cannot do, of course, astroseismology during the, the, the collapse of two black holes or neutral star black hole um, objects, but we can study the uh, oscillations that such objects have in the pre-phases. And that's actually also being developed via uh, compact objects that have white dwarfs, because we can do very well white dwarf seismology. And of course, if uh, a white dwarf uh, a circle, uh, circles a, a more massive star that is yet evolving and dumping material on the white dwarf, then the white dwarf may hit the Chandrasekhar limit and explode as a supernova. And none of not all these uh, objects get disrupted. So they, it stays as a compact binary. And by the time the companion um, explodes, we can also have hit oscillatory signal. So it's certainly true that uh, stripped stars, close companions, uh, white dwarf seismology is, is happening. It's more difficult. These are small objects. And as you should know by now, hopefully, the smaller the object, the faster the, the waves. So this is at very high frequency. And there we hit the other limits of Kepler and Tess. If you have you know, uh, I didn't mention it. If you have integrations of light that are smeared over several minutes to half an hour, and if your oscillations move up and down with 10 seconds, you won't be able to see it because you don't have the resolving power in time. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So this is again why the, so both Kepler and Tess had a, a Kepler's fastest cadence was one minute, but one minute for white dwarf astroseismology is pretty slow. Now Tess is doing 20 seconds for some stars and that's fantastic for compact stars, but these tend to be faint while Tess is made for bright stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Again, Plato will solve that because it will have two and a half seconds in its uh, uh, filtered uh, two telescopes and 50 seconds or 25 seconds for all its other stars. So it's way higher cadence and it's a bigger machinery to to treat uh, gravitational wave progenitors, as I call them. That's very exciting. Thank you. Okay, um, we have one more question from the audience here. And uh, this one comes from Sam Lee. And I think it's one that's probably echoed by a lot of people here. Um, what contributions can we amateur data miners make to uh, the studies that you are doing and other people in astro seismology are doing? Um, what what should we be going out and, and doing to support you? Yeah, if the question wouldn't have come, I would have closed with that myself, actually, <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> as I always do when I have an audience where there are some very clever um amateur astronomers or uh, a mixed bag of professionals and amateur astronomers. It's my answer is very simple. There are two ways that where you can really help. One way is ground based astroseismology. If you have CCDs that reach millimagnitude, yeah? which is not so uncommon. I mean, the bigger the star, the the higher its amplitude also huh? in a certain way. So millimagnitude uh, astroseismology is still very valuable. And where is it valuable? In the area where we have a hard time to get the appropriate data. And that is in the regime where we have very big stars because they are slow pulsators. Huh? The sound waves take a long time to travel, right? And the amplitude is so bigger. So it may take years and years and years, like what I had to do for my PhD, yeah, that one star I showed. Please go and hunt big giant stars at, if you can, millimagnitude level. If you reach 10 millimagnitude, it's still also fine for the bigger ones. We don't have the data sets for the moment that can do that. And here's where AAV is always optimally, I mean, you're, you're optimally equipped to do that, I would say. Right? That's one thing. 
in the low as uh, in the lower amplitude regime it's too hard for you to bring the data that are useful but as i was saying there are millions of light curves full frame images even of the test mission in the public domain and what we are lacking and uh, that's a bit uh, where you have to push us professionals would be citizen science projects where you can help us unravel the Fourier transforms. But for that, we first need to compose the light curves because of course I show beautiful light curves. That's what you do as a lecturer, but this doesn't drop from the satellite like that. So there's a whole pre-processing that is being done. And the, the NASA teams are doing a fantastic job. We improve it professionals, but you could start off by public data and try and hunt for signals of oscillations in millions of stars. And so that would help us, but I understand from your question. And again, I'm holding a plea to professionals, including myself, we should offer more citizen science tools to help the community do that. Of course, that's not observing yourself, which you, this crowd loves to do, of course. Huh? <laughs> but there's also a whole lot of people and, and pupils and, and young youngsters in general who would like to be involved in research. And so one of the things we want to try and do is come up with citizen science projects. That's within this big uh, uh, grant scheme that I told you about. Huh? Uh, I think now is a good time. We have enough experience now to offer this. We, we, I mean, don't forget that graviton inertial astroseismology is, is dumb, but most stars are, are fast rotators, right? And so we had to develop it first. First, we had to train ourselves. Now we can convey our knowledge to people who would like to help us in finding um, interesting stars, let's say. The same for the tides. Huh? That's even a better a better case for, for uh, input from uh, people who do not do this uh, on a daily uh, business, because you can, you can help us find eclipsing binaries. Yeah. And if we have eclipsing binaries, I'm sure they will oscillate one one or two components and so then we can dive deeper into suitable pulsating eclipsing binaries for now our catalogs of such objects where we could develop tidal astroseismology is still uh too small the catalogs are too small so um why don't i round off by saying you can ping me every once in a while to say hey where's your citizen science uh, plan <laughs> okay. all right <laughs> thank you so much professor Ertz. Uh -huh. I'm Connie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's thank a, you, Connie. Sounds much younger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it was a great pleasure. Well, keep go keep going. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share our closing slide here, and um, just begin our closing announcements with a heartfelt thank you to Connie for sharing her time and knowledge with us today. That was a truly excellent presentation that you gave and your question and answer session was very informative. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to visit with us. It was a pleasure. Uh, before we close, I would also like to thank again our sponsor, Boyce Astro. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. Thanks to everyone who joined in today, and uh, I would like to extend a special thank you to everyone here who made a donation during our recent annual campaign. Your contributions have helped ensure another great year of making an impact on variable star science. So thank you, each of you. We're so grateful for your support. Today's broadcast has been recorded, and if you would like to go back and reference the recording, you can find it on our Facebook page, where it will be automatically uploaded just as soon as this webinar ends. Pretty soon, we will also upload it to our YouTube channel, where it will join an enormous library of educational videos stretching back into 2020. You can find our library on YouTube by searching for the username AAVSOHQ. When you log out of this webinar, you should be automatically shown a survey. I would really appreciate it if you could fill it out, 
let us know what you thought and uh, what we could do better next time. All right, to close, I would like to express one last huge thank you to Connie from all of us here at the AAVSO. We appreciate you. A pleasure. Bye.